I really didn't know what I was doing. I did exactly what my boss told me. But I do remember that driving down the road when I became a manager, now I got eight people, I got to teach them how to sell. I remember coming to this conclusion. I know how to do this job, but I don't have to teach somebody to do this job. Welcome to the I Own It Podcast with Ben Reinberg. We are live today in Laguna Beach, California at the Ben Reinberg I Own It studio. Today is a, is a special day for me, and I want to communicate to everyone in life, we are always selling. Whether you're buying or selling or communicating, you are always selling. And I want to explain what that means. Whether you're talking to your kids, a significant other, whether it's employees, whether it's coworkers, you name it, you're always in a position where you have to be part of a sales process or pieces of it. And I felt it was important that we share with you today how the sales process works, having an expert that's been there, done it. He's been doing this for decades. He is an author, a speaker. He has his own academy. He teaches. He is a extremely generous person, and I wanted to bring him on to be able to share and drop this knowledge on all of you, because all of us, including me and this gentleman, are always part of a sales process. Jerry Acuff, welcome to the show. It is such a pleasure to have you. I am so grateful. Let's get right into it. Sure. So, so people can understand how talented and special you, you are. Let's just start off with selling. I mean, you talk about how in people's perception, how do you define selling? What is your definition of selling? I tell you, I, I stole my definition, you know, because I, I don't have, you know, I, I know because I read a lot, I study a lot, especially, you know, human behavior, et cetera. But uh, and, and this was really interesting because my first two sales jobs, I was not very good. I got fired, you know, because I, I ran out of family and friends and insurance. And and then I, I went to work for Lipton Tea and I was selling tea in, in, in West Tennessee. And, and then I couldn't get out of the car and call on customers because I had such sales reluctance. And so uh, I got a job in coaching football So because what I want to do is to, you know, coach football. And then I got rejected from graduate school at Northeast Louisiana University. And that's kind of hard to do. At least it was back in the 70s. And so I wound up getting a job in the pharmaceutical business. And and honestly, the first six years, and I was in six years, then they promoted me. I really didn't know what I was doing. I did exactly what my boss told me. But I do remember that driving down the road when I became a manager, and I got eight people, I got to teach them how to sell. I remember coming to this conclusion. I know how to do this job, but I don't have to teach somebody to do this job. So I went and I bought a book by Roger Staubach called Winning Strategies and Selling. It's not a great book, but it... But he has one quote in there from a guy named uh, Charlie Tremendous Jones. He said this, and this changed my life. He said, chances are you'll be the same person five years from today that you are today with the exception of two things, the people you meet and the books you read. And the person who won't read is truly no better off than the person who can't read. Now, I had read three books in 10 years. I had read Jaws. I read QB7 by Leon Uris. And I, and I thought, well, hell, if I ever have to move to New Jersey, I better read The Godfather. <laughs> and um, since then, I've read, I've, I've, I've written four bestsellers. I got another one coming out in January, uh, and then I'm writing with another uh, sales guru named Jeremy Miner. And if you don't know him, you do need to know Jeremy, because uh, I've learned so much from him. He's twenty, he's thirty years younger than me, uh, and he had me on his podcast. And he called me afterwards, and he said, "You know, I've talked to twenty five great sales." people with big time names. He said, none of these people know sales like you do. And so he and I developed a relationship. Now we're writing a book, but, but, but I, I, in reading the book, I, I actually listened to a guy named Fred Herman. And he says, the most important thing that you need is your, what it have the right definition of selling. And so the very first chapter in my sales book called stop acting like a seller, start thinking like a buyer, which I think I wrote 15, 16 years ago uh, says this, you know, uh, and all I did was steal Fred Herman's. But St Fred Herman said, selling is teaching. In every successful sale, someone learns something that they didn't know before. And it's that new insight, that new learning that causes them to want to do something different. 
The second thing he said is that selling is finding out what people want and helping them get it. He said, now here's the problem with that concept. Most people don't know what they want, but they think they do. Our job as salespeople is to truly understand their situation and then be able to offer them something if we have something that would benef benefit them. And if you don't have anything, then you need to go someplace else. Because if they don't need what we have, we have no right to sell them what we do have. And that was a gigantic learning for me because it said, holy smokes, all I have to do is to go and teach people. And I'm good at that. Or all I have to do is find out what people want and help them get it. Now, far, far, far too many salespeople never really do understand what the customer wants because they're in such a hurry to sell something. And one of the things I write in my, my first in my book is the less you care about the sale, the more you sell. Now, what do you care about? You care about being good at your job. And so you really you do kind of sharpen the saw, et cetera. So so my definition of selling is exactly what Fred Herman's was. Selling is teaching, selling, find out what people would want, helping them get it. And uh, most people don't know what they want, but they think they do. So that's what selling is. And so as long as I can be true to that, I mean, when I started my business 21 years ago, and I and, and this is interesting because I was 51, I had a one-year-old, and uh, I had just gotten fired from a job as a VP of sales where I had taken them from six from 40 million to eight million, but I disagreed with the chairman of the board and he fired me. And I have enough money, Ben, to to last me four months, and I'm 51 years old, and I don't have any idea what the heck I'm going to do. <laughs> and a guy calls me that used to work for me, and he asked me if I would do a speech. And I said, David, what do you want me to do a speech for? Well, I got these people in my organization and they want you. They all want to hold hands and sing songs. They don't want to be accountable. And you're the most motivational speaker I've ever heard. And I want you to come and get these people excited. And I said, David, look, I got to be honest with you. I need the money, but you'd be wasting your money. Because, see, he didn't really want somebody to inspire his people. He wanted his leaders to be good at holding their people accountable. And he'd never thought of that. I said, so let me tell you what you need, David. You need somebody who can come in there who understands change management, which I do, and you need them to work with your leaders for six months. Now, if in that six months you want me to do a speech, I'll be happy to do it. But you need a consulting project with somebody who can help your folks to make the change that you want them to make. So he says, can you do that? And I said, well, I probably could. He said, send me a proposal. Now, I don't even have a company. So I walked down the street, lawyer lived three doors down, start me a, a, an LLC, call it a Delta because that means change. And that was my first client. But my first client I got by telling him I didn't think he needed it. And now let's, he's let's, been a client of mine for 20 years. I also hired him as a rep and he wound up being the president of AstraZeneca in China. And now he's a big shot in, a, in an American drug company. I, I want to circle back on one of the things you said. You said about you know, spending time and not rushing through on a sale. And it's such an important point because when you can take someone and build that rapport and build the relationship, which you preach about, which I agree with you, is instead of rushing through it, you be, it becomes more of an efficient process because you're closing deals, you're closing more deals, and you hit the end goal a little bit faster just yeah. by taking the time to care, build that rapport. And, and that's exactly how I feel where success lies in selling. One, one of the other things is you mentioned reading and how powerful knowledge is. And right. you have to teach and you have to be an expert because in order to build rapport, people have to feel comfortable with you that you're the expert right. and you have to know what you're selling and understand it and the benefits and why you're doing it and why the other person needs it. If they don't yeah. need it, it, why are you selling it? Right. right. And so yep. you have to ask questions and find that out. What do you recommend? You mentioned reading. What are, say, five or eight books you could share with, with the masses here of that you would suggest to, if they couldn't afford to hire you and they wanted to learn selling before they could hire someone like you or at least get mentored or coach or sure. come to an academy, what are those books that you would recommend? Well, that's a great question. I mean, if it's, if it's about selling, I mean, certainly I think my book, there's, there's two books I wrote, but you really only need to re re read one. The, the It's Stop Acting Like a Seller, Start Thinking Like a Buyer uh, is a book that I wrote. The last third of that book, Ben, is uh, basically a condensed version of my first book, which is called The Relationship 
edge in business. And my hypothesis there is that when I actually build a business relationship with you, you will listen to me differently than you listen to other salespeople. Now, how do I do that? Uh, we teach people, how do you do that? And the other thing that, that we teach people is <clears throat> the average person that we're talking to as a, as a prospector or potential client, they believe their, 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 their innate bias is that we're biased. In other words, we're there to sell them whatever we got. And I think the way you build trust is actually to tell people that you're not biased. I mean, if you look at, you know, the, the business that I spend a lot of time in, in pharmaceuticals, you know, the number one product in the world, I think, has got a 38 chair. Well, heck, you could go into any doctor in America if you had a competitive product and say, look, our product's not for everybody. I mean, the number one product in the world isn't for everybody. And whenever you say that, you sound different than everybody else. You know, Brendan Kane wrote a really good book, and it's a good book. I don't recommend it because I'm about to tell you what I think everything that he said was really brilliant because a lot of it was over my head. But one of the things he said is that if you want to get somebody's attention, you need to practice pattern interruption that makes them want to learn more. So when I go in to talk to somebody, and whether it's a, a big client, like a big pharmaceutical company, and I might be talking to 10 people, you know, I'll start by saying, look, I'm going to make the assumption that you really do not want to hire me. Now, that is pattern interruption, because that's not what the average consultant says. And then they'll say, well, why? And I said, because, look, I used to run a company. I don't want to hire any consultant. If I thought we could do it ourselves, I'd do it. So tell me, why did you call me? Well, we can't do it our, ourselves. And I said, well, tell me what you've done. Well, why do you want to know that? I said, well, the reality is, what if I'm going to do the same thing you're going to do that you did? It didn't work. I mean, then why would you hire me? And so then we began this discussion where they realized that I was just trying to find out what had they done? Did it work? And then, they, then I asked them this question. I said, do you have any idea why your customers aren't buying from you? They said, yeah. And they told me what it was. I said, I don't think you're right. And they said, you know, what do you, th do you know what it is? I said, yeah, I'm about 98% sure. They said, well, you're going to tell us? I said, not until you pay me. Uh, but, I asked, but let me tell you why I'm going to do it that way, because I'm going to actually go out and find out if my hypothesis is correct. But I will tell you this. If it is correct, I will be able to change. My company will change your business very shortly. Now, at that time, they had an 18 share. They thought they would have 40. So they're two hundred and twenty million dollars buying forecast. And in nine months, we had them at 52 market share. We just figured out things that they hadn't even thought of too many people. I always say selling is a thinking person's game. And, and, you know, Jeremy would tell you the guy I wrote my book with, and I actually posted this on LinkedIn this past week is that your voice is one of the most important things you have. And so if you read Chris Voss's book, and this is one I, I would, I would suggest Chris Voss wrote never split the difference. And he talks about how important not only your voice is, but inflection and pausing. Far too many salespeople talk too fast. Now, the other book I would read is Weldon Long's book, The Power of Consistency. And his book is, is basically a modern day version of Psycho-Cybernetics by Dr. Maxwell Maltz. I would also re read Questions at Sell. And I'm going to have to think about, uh, I'll come to, to a minute, but this is a book that I actually endorsed and I wrote it a long time, but you can't read that book and not learn 10 questions that you ought to ask customers because it's so well written. So Jerry, in my business alliance, constantly putting myself in a position with my investors and I'm an investor myself in, in many of our deals, yet to hear you talk about mindset. You describe how people often think like a seller, yeah. right? Instead of thinking like a buyer. Right. Why do you believe it is that many people don't instinctively put themselves in the buyer's shoes? And what are some of the most effective practical tips you have for taking a more empathetic point of view with these folks? Yeah, that's a good question. A couple of things. I think the reason why, and this is, you know, my view of the world, and I've been in this business 48 years, <clears throat> and I've owned this company for 21 years, and we've done business, I think, with 19 of the top 100 companies in the world. But I think what happens is, and I think Tony Robbins probably said it better than anybody. He said, look, if what you're doing is not working, it means you've been taught wrong. And I think far too many people have been taught that selling is, you know, open the call, ask questions, tell the story, you know, handle objections, et cetera. It's really not about 
thinking like trying to understand what the customer thinks. My bias is you cannot change what someone thinks unless you know what they think. And far too many salespeople are not taught how do you have the patience and what kind of strategies can you use to get the customer to actually want to hear what you have to say. And so what happens is that the vast majority of salespeople, in my opinion, they inadvertently and unintentionally create sales resistance the moment they sound like every other salesperson. And so what we teach people is to go in and say to somebody, look, I'd like to do something a little different today. Now, if I say that to you, you are going to ask me, well, what do you want to do? And I'm going to say, well, I really don't, I don't want to sell you anything. What I'd like to do is to try and understand how do people like you make decisions in categories like this when there's so many things that you have to contemplate. And what I find in that situation, Ben, is that most people, they'll sit back and they'll, they'll, you know, they'll feel like they're being interviewed. Well, they are being interviewed. Uh, but what I'm trying to find out is what are the things that make you tick? You know, I heard somebody say one time to, to sell Jane Brown, what Jane Brown buys, you have to see the world through Jane Brown's eyes. And most salespeople are interested in the sale and not in how they can actually help the customer uh, succeed. I mean, I used to run a drug company a long time ago and we had a product, it was a really good product. And I had a pharmacist in the East call me and say, we have physicians who are misusing our pro- uh, your product and we can't get them to stop. They were brain surgeons, right? I'm the guy who's responsible for P&L for this business. Can I fly over there? And if you can get all these doctors together, I'll ask them to please don't use our product. He said, you would do that? I don't want anybody using our product if it's inappropriate. So I had consulted with our medical department and they said, no, 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 that's not, our product should not be used in that kind of surgery, et cetera. So I did, I flew over there, got these people together. And I said, look, y'all need to know, I got a degree in English and I had a hard time getting that. I was on academic probation every semester you could possibly be. So I do not fashion myself as an intellect or certainly a medical person. However, I did consult with our medical group and their advice was that our products should not be used in the kind of surgeries that folks like you do. And the reason why is because if you do, it'll accelerate the resistance to this product by these pathogens. And that's not what we want at all. So I'm asking you, and I'm going to be the one who's going to take the hit from this financially, just don't use our product. And instantly they quit using our product. But to me, a lot of this is about what is the right thing to do? And to me, the right thing to do is to try and figure out, okay, what is the right thing to do in this situation? And I think the vast majority of people stop one, two, three questions before they actually really understand what's going on in the mind of the customer. And and to revert back, I mean, one of the things that is really something that I use that you taught me that I never told you this is for my business, this investment might not be for you. Yeah. And and that kind of just lowers the barrier. And then you have a discussion and then you get into, like you said, ask them four or five questions and find out who what they're doing, build a rapport with them, understand what do they want? Do you want to invest in Alliances Fund? Do you want to invest? Do you want to buy this product? Do you want to buy a car? Whatever yeah. you're selling and, and find out because... Why are they here? Why are they in front of you? Okay. Yeah. Why why did they fill out like a lot of people now, Jerry, are doing online sales? Why did they fill out the landing page? Like no one really asked that. It's like, why are you in my sphere? Yeah. Why are you here? And I yeah. think that's really important what you touched on. That's a very simple question, too. And I mean, I, I tell you a story. I write about this in my book. I walk into staples in Flagstaff, Arizona. And at the time, my wife and I had a home in Scottsdale and we had a home in, in Flagstaff. So, and we had just bought this house. And so I walk in, I, I need a printer. And so I walk in and so they hear this 21 year old kid from North, Northern Arizona. Here's what he says to me. Now, I think this guy's a genius. He says, uh, are you looking for anything in particular? Now, he's the only person in my life who's ever said that to me in a retail situation. They all say, can I help you? He said, I said, yeah, I'm looking for the printers. He said, well, let me show you where they are. So he takes me to the printers. He said, okay, there's these six. He said, so if I were you, I'd look at these. And he starts to walk away. I said, whoa, 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 get back here. I said, do you know anything about these printers? He said, yeah. I said, well, which one would you buy? Then he asked me this question. Well, what are you going to use it for? 
I don't know. Now, this is 15 years ago, right? <laughs> he said, well, look, you know, these three over here are really good at almost anything, including photos. These three over here can't do photos, but they're really good printers. So if you're not going to use photos, I would make a decision between these three. And I said, well, which one would you buy? He said, well, I'd buy the one in the middle. And he said, and I said, well, why would you do that? He said, well, candidly, they're all really good, but this one is easier to set up. And I get the sense that you're not very good at setting this stuff up. So you probably need something easier. And I said, boy, you're absolutely right. Now, here's his next question, Ben. He says, uh, is your house one story or two? Mm. Now, you think this is a question that I'm expecting from a Staples floor salesman? And I said, it's two stories. Why do you ask? He said, do you think you'd ever want to be upstairs and print downstairs? And I said, yeah. He said, do you have a router? I didn't even know what a router was. So my point is, I, he sold me a printer, a router, of a whole bunch of cables, and all of this because I walked in there thinking I wanted a printer. What I really wanted was the capability to be able to print anywhere in my house. And he was smart enough to understand that. Otherwise, I'd have printed out about that thing and then tried to print it from upstairs to downstairs, and I'd have been madder than a hornet. And guess what? You're going to go back to that store. All the time. I'd like yep. to go back and hire the guy. Yeah, so, and, and, and the lesson is you'll spend more money there than you originally than the outset yeah. and that's a good lesson and it it's it really has i mean at the end of the day it's an integrity component yes. if you live your life with integrity and you're a teacher and you educate that's why what you teach has success yeah and and it creates a well-rounded process too yeah. let's talk about so nearly one in eight jobs jerry in america are sales jobs it's right. like 10 million plus i think is a stat and as a sales leader and a mentor and a coach, and I'm sure you've seen the gamut in your career, um, what are the internal qualities you believe that you had to be a superstar salesman that you could share with people? And when you're doing consulting work, okay, what are some of the top issues you see that hold people back from reaching their potential to become successful in sales? Yeah, those are two big questions. You know, I think what's made me successful is I have a gigantic fear of failure. And so, you know, I've, I've always and I've had significant failures in my life and I've overcome them and I've become successful. And, you know, probably what uh, some people would, would call quite wealthy. And, you know, I, I'm not, you know, I ain't Warren Buffett, but I mean, we're not going to have any crowdfunding for Jerry and his family. But I was always scared that I was going to fail. And so I always tried to work harder. I tried to learn more than, than other people did. Uh, I think the other thing too, Ben, and I, I can't emphasize this enough. I think it's the people who, who, who've coached me. You know, there's a really interesting book. And if you get a chance, in fact, I, you don't need to buy the book. I, I, if you give me your email, I'll actually send you a, uh, I'll just send you a picture of this one page. Cause there's Maltz used to talk about, you know, the, the, the inner self, a guy named Willingham took that to, to another extreme. And he talked about, your three dimensions of human performance. One is intellectual, one's emotional, and the third one is what he calls the creative unconscious, which is your self-image. And I learned from that that if you have the right mentors, if you have the right people that you 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 lean on to learn from, you can become anything. Now, when I was 37 years old, you know, I want my life's dream was to be a regional manager for a drug company. Now, a regional manager for a drug company makes a buck fifty, you know, probably gets makes another fifty bonus, and and that's what I wanted to be, and that's all I thought I had to. I thought all the, the the talent I thought I had, and so one of my mentors was a guy named Don Cutcliffe, and he and I competed for a regional manager job. He was ten years older than me, and he gets a job, and I don't, and now he's my boss. So he comes to Birmingham where I lived at the time. He lived in Tampa, still does. And he came to me and he said this to me and he changed my life in every every conceivable way in two minutes. He said this to me. He said, Jerry, I came to tell you tonight two things. One, you should have got this job, not me. You're far more qualified to do it than I am. But they gave it to me and they didn't give it to you and I'm not giving it back. And then he said this to me, Ben. He said, but I have to tell you, Jerry, this job's not big enough for you. You need to be running our company. Now, I have to tell you, Ben, I'm 37 years old. I had been very successful. The, the thought of me running a lemonade stand was not in my, my mindset. But see, what he did, he changed my view of me and what great mentors do. And I've had so many of them. In fact, every year on Boss's Day, 
I write the 30, this is now 32 people's names who've changed my life. And so, so much of it is not only what I've read and not only what my mindset is, which is failure is not an option. I will find a way to succeed, but it's also these people who made me stretch and see that I had more in my tank. And that's why when I sign a book, I'll always say, always be incredible. There's greatness in you. And so few people believe that they have greatness in them because they're hearing they're surrounding themselves with the wrong people. It's a great point. Let's circle back and talk about fear. You know, you talked about having a challenging childhood, yes. right? Okay. And the fear of not being like your parents really was your, that was your foundation to drive you to who you are today. Do you still have this same fear today or has it dissipated? And what motivates you now? to keep working today based on what you've achieved? Well, I'm the kind of person who's not very good at sitting around. My hobby is mentoring college basketball coaches. And I mentor probably two of the best top 20 in the country. And, I, and I've been with both of them for over 14 years. Um, and I like, I like helping them with leadership issues, et cetera. Um, but no, what keeps me working is, you know, I have not yet achieved what I want to financially for my family. I'm not far from it, but I, I'm not going to quit until I get where, you know, what I, I can show you what's in my pocket, which is my goals. Mm -hmm. And when I get there, then I'll slow down. But yeah, the fear, I, I don't have as much of a fear of failure. I have it episodically, you know, like uh, I had brain surgery this year. I mean, and I don't recommend that as a hobby for anybody. So, you know, so it was three months basically that I, I couldn't work. And so in my own mind, I haven't achieved enough this year. But our company is doing really good, and I'm really proud of our folks. And But no, I, I don't have the same kind of fear I used to because um, I've had lots of success over the last probably 21 or 22 years. But I, what I am driven by is helping other people succeed. I'm a huge believer in helping other people get jobs, especially people that I, you know, I believe in, and I don't mind putting my name you know, with them. And I'm a big believer that anybody who asks me for help, I give it to them. Let's talk about beliefs because that's so important. And we talk about self-awareness, which is so important, especially when you're selling or living your life. What are the three important sales beliefs? I know you teach this a lot. I think it's extremely valuable. Explain to everyone the three sales beliefs that create success. Well, I think, I think you have to have the right definition of selling because if you have the right definition of selling, then the next thing that falls into place is intent. What is your intent? So if you intent don't have the right selling definition, it you can can't create have the right failure. Intent. It creates failure. Well, if you don't have it, you, well, it's not going to create excellence. Let's just say that. There's an awful lot of people who can bully themselves into some degree of success. The question is, could they be dramatically more successful if they actually knew how to build valuable business relationships? If they knew how to do a lot better job of asking questions that help the customer come to their own conclusion. See, great salespeople, and Jeremy and I'll tell you this in our, in our newest book, great salespeople get the customer to come to their own conclusion about what they need. Same thing this kid did for me at Staples. How, well, I don't even know what a damn router is, but he taught me that I needed a router, I needed these cables, and if without him, I'd, I go home unhappy. And I think the third thing that I teach people, especially in our business, but I think it's probably true in almost any business. If you believe that selling is an occupation, I think you're making a mistake. Because what I would say to you is that it's an opportunity. And I'd say even more than that, it's a responsibility for you to help change other people's lives. And I can tell you, my father had Alzheimer's. And, you know, my brother and I went to see him the last time I saw him. And he told me, he said, hey, dad, and I'm, the, I'm named after my dad, right? And my brothers and sisters call me FHB, which stands for Fairy Boy. So we go see my old man. This is in 2010. And on the way up there, my brother says, now, dad that has no cognition, none, zero. So we get there and he, he has no cognition. So, but I always look at the chart to see what he's on. And he's on a product called Exelon Patch. And that's a Novartis product, right? And it's for cognition. So the question I'm asking myself, because there's nobody else to talk to, is why is he on this? He has no cognition. So we got ready to leave. He's lost 60 pounds. He's down to 120. And... Um, as we're getting ready to leave, I, you know, I bend down and kiss him. I say, Dad, love you. And as I walk to the door, he sits up in the bed and he says, Jerry, 
and he startled me because he, he, he that was the most first coaching thing he said. And I turned around and I said, what, Dad? He said, I love you, son. Now, I tell people this story because when I walked out that door, I realized that I had a life-changing moment because a salesman did their job. It's just that simple. And that's the day that I actually realized that if you're really good at selling, you will imp- you're impacting an awful lot of people's lives. You don't know who they are. You might know one person, but you don't know all the people that you're sending to college or the people that they're teaching the stuff that you're teaching them. You are changing people's lives. And when you understand that this this is a, a, an opportunity for us to have a magnificent impact on I get all kinds of letters from people thanking me for the stuff that we do. And I don't think that we're, you know, we're not splitting the atom here. But what we are doing is getting people to take a hard look at how do you actually conduct yourselves when you're in a selling situation. And if you do it with the right intent, the right definition and the right integrity, you'll be changing a lot of people's lives and not the least of which will be your own. And and just to add to that, which I think is so important, is that if you can help solve a problem or a challenge and someone needs what you have and you have the right product, you have a moral and ethical obligation to sell it to them. Yes, That's absolutely. how I look at it. Yeah. Because again, it goes to your point of helping people and serving them and benefiting them and having integrity. In my head, okay, my most memorable sales coaching moment is when Jordan Belfort, you know, the, the wolf yeah. of Wall Street, he's out there in the public. He has his exercise of sell me this pen, right? Yeah. And I'm curious, do you have a strong point of view on the kinds of coaching tactics that are most effective and those that sound good but don't really translate to desired results? Yeah, you know, that that pen thing is interesting because Fred Herman, the guy who gave me the, the thing about uh, selling his teaching, is find out what people want. He was actually on the Mike Douglas show. And then, you, you know, most people don't know who Mike Douglas is. Sure. Mike Douglas had this TV show in Philadelphia. And so Douglas says, okay, you're the greatest salesman in the world. Uh, sell me this pen. And here's how he sold the pen. Oh, he said, sell me this ashtray. And so Fred says, uh, this, is pretty li- this, this is a pretty nice looking ashtray here, isn't it? And he said, so if you had this thing, what would you do with it? And so Mike said, uh, well, you know, I, we have people who smoke around here. And he said, it is decorative. So you could use it as a decoration or you could use it to keep people from smoking. He said, um, well, what do you think you'd give for it? He said, I, thought, I think I'd pay 10 bucks for it. He said, I'll let you have it for that. That was it. <laughs> and so his, his whole point was, you know, guide me to the decision that you wish me to make if it's right. And I'll do the right thing. And so to me, that some of the most important things that we do is tell people that what you're asking us for is not what you need. And, you know, I'll tell you what you need. Now, you, you can make your own decision. But I have clients. I had one call me the other day. You know, we, we need you here for three hours. What do you want to do? And I said, well, I want to speak for 30. And then I want to do workshops here. People can actually practice this stuff. You know, just listen to me. It's going to change 4% of people. You got, you got 100 people there. I'm going to change four. I wouldn't pay me diddly. To change four people. But if you give me the opportunity to bring one of my other people who's just as good as I am, and we get the chance to spend three hours with them, you know, after we give them the basics, then we're going to change a lot of people's lives. We just did a product. We're just working, we're working on a product now that's, that's not been doing very good. We went, we hadn't even given them the, their playbook yet. And before we gave them their playbook, their sales went up 43% from the second quarter to third quarter because we taught them the basics of how can you be great at selling. Okay. The biggest mistake I think most salespeople make is they don't understand what a valuable business relationship is. That's one. Two, they're not very good at what I would call leveraging relationships. And so if they want to meet somebody, they don't know what words to say. If they know somebody and they want to find out, could that person refer? We teach them those things. And then I think the other thing is, you know, they go there with the mindset that they have to sell and they're, they're getting this pressure from their bosses. You know, you got to sell, sell, sell. When in reality, it's a lot easier to sell. I, I did the thing the other day for a company that was great. There's this, this new product and it's really a phenomenal product. It's a medical device. I mean, it's, a, it's unbelievable. It's, if this thing's successful, it'll change millions of people's lives because it has an impact on the size of your infarct if you have a, have a heart attack. And so the guy who's leading the, there's only 10 people in the room, right? And the guy who hired me to come, a friend of mine, he tells me, he said, now I got one guy who's got 85% of all of our business, 85%. And I said, well, I want to interview him. So I interviewed him, nicest guy you'd ever meet. 
And then when I gave him the definition of selling, he said, you know, well, define selling. I said, selling is teaching. And the moment I said that, Ben, he said, oh, my God, I now realize why I'm so successful at selling. I said, well, OK, say more about that. Abe. He said, I was a teacher for so many years. All I did was translate what a great teacher does to what a great salesman does. That's why all these people are buying. And so I think so much of it is up here. Uh, you got to get the right idea that you're not being pushy. I always think, and like closing is interesting. I teach people, how can you ask for a commitment where they won't say no? And, and I actually created this based on how I used to ask girls out in high school. Okay. So let, what's the secret sauce then, Jerry? Well, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't ask them out until somebody had told me they'd go. And so I, so I figured, how do you do that in selling? So you, 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 you basically see, do you have alignment? If you do, then you say, okay, I get the sense that you're now ready to begin to think about what might be the next step. Now, there, you're only going to get two answers to that. You're going to get, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, we're ready. And then you can go right on and ask them for whatever you want. Or they're going to say, well, I'm still concerned about X. Well, still concerned about X is fundamentally no, but at least it tells me what their hesitation is. But I, I created that because I felt that closing the way people taught it is inconsistent with my uh, being. It's inconsistent with who I am. So I wanted to create something that was consistent for me, that would work for me because I'm not a pushy salesperson. Understood. You talk about 10 key competencies you and your team uh, must have to be a strong sale at sales coaching, right? Do you a, encounter... A right. Well, yeah. do, you, do you encounter many other coaches that don't have the knowledge to be teaching? What experiences and, and, and know-how tend to be the areas of inspiring sales coaches lack? Well, you know, we have our own coaching program. We call it Coaching Catalyst because what we've learned is that coaching selling is a completely different skill set than just coaching, period. So if I've got to coach you on the, how, how the product works or how the, you know, the investment works and all that, that's a completely different thing than I got to teach you on how do you actually engage customers? How do you actually get customers to want to listen? So the biggest problem we find with managers is that they, they, they're, most of them are not prepared to be managers. Um, we, we do a survey about every two or three years. One of the things that we find is that only 14 or 15 percent of reps go to the manager for advice about how to sell somebody who's tough. That means 85 percent of the time they're going to one of their colleagues. Now, that's fine if one of your colleagues is phenomenal. But if they suck canal water, they're getting bad advice. So part of it is we, you know, we always say, look, you can't teach your coach what you don't know. You can't teach your coach, which that's not a very complex thing. So to me, number one, you have to know the stuff. Number two, you have to be authentic and put yourself out there. When I was a first line manager, I made every other call. Now, I didn't make every other call because I was that good, because I will tell you, I had 11 salespeople. If I had to force rank myself into that group, I'd be number eight because I hired people who were phenomenally successful. <clears throat> But what I wanted them to see was that failure is okay. Lousy calls are okay. I think the other thing, and this is one of the things I tell all my coaches, I actually spoke to the athletic department at my college last uh, on Monday before I left. And I told them, I said, look, if you want these people to run through a wall for you, if you want these people to do whatever you'd ask them, you have to love them. And I don't mean date them. I mean, you got to love them. And you got to love them for what they are, not for what you wish they were. Your job is if they're not what you want them to be, it's your job to change them. It's your job to build a relationship with them where they understand that every single thing I do for you as your coach, I do because I love you. I want you, and, and I tell them, everybody I hire, I say, let me, I want you to understand this. I want you to be successful in this job. I want you to be successful in our company. I want you to be successful in life. And everything I do will be driven towards those things. And if you leave me at some point in time, and many of them do because they get a better opportunity, and I'm always a cheerleader. If you get a better opportunity, I want you to go. Now, what I've also found, Ben, is that I would say 70% of the people who have left me within a year have hired us. So I actually had a guy from one of my best friends say, you know, I finally figured out your method of success. He said, you bring in these people. 
that have all this experience and you let them work for you for a year and then they come and hire you. But they now know what the inner workings of the thing looks like. But I think you have to know, you have to be as good a salesman as as the best salesman in your group. You got to you have to share. Uh, you have to be compassionate. My first boss taught me you have to be family oriented. You have to listen to your employees. We have we had a we had a call yesterday with our team. We raised everybody's salary because mm -hmm. inflation. Right. Right. So you know I had a, I had a, I had a conversation with the folks president of the company, you know, who I hired not 11 and a half years ago. And he said, Hey, I think we got to raise everybody's employee, everybody's salary. And I said, okay. So I got up at four o'clock in the next morning and I wrote down how much I thought everybody should get. All of them were more than 10%. And I gave it to him. He said, well, I'm going to change a couple of these. I said, change whatever you want. But I said, I think your idea is terrific. Um, but you know, we do things in a small company. You can't do in a big company. You know, we don't, we don't have dental benefits. Right. Mm -hmm. So I found out, okay, we don't have dental benefits, but we got people who need braces. So I just said, we got dental benefit now and just put it on your expense report. Yeah. Instead of $1,500 one year, put it on there for two years. Let me, and let when me you ask do you that, something. you build, you build a culture. Now, the last thing I would say to you, is probably the most important thing is that the, when I became a manager and I was a very successful manager for, I think for eight years, I had the number one district seven out of eight years out of 70. The first thing I did, and I don't know why I did this, Ben, but it, it, it turned out to be genius. I said, look, we're going to begin every meeting. We, we Back then, we met four times a year. Uh, we, every meeting, we're going to begin the same way. I'm going to ask every single person in this room, what are you doing to develop yourself as a human being? And I expect you to have an answer. doesn't have to be about work. You can want to learn how to play a piano. You can want to learn how to be a better Girl Scout leader. You can learn how to be a deacon in your church. I don't care. But I want you learning something. And so it took me about nine months before everybody was genuine. Right. Half of them, you know, got on board fairly quickly and the other half, you know, they came kicking and screaming. But what I found was when you create a learning environment as a part of your culture, people will self-manage. They will share far more with each other than anybody ever would. And they'll be excited about working because there is an excitement to learning. And so, I mean, that's what we try and do now in, in our company. Somebody asked me this week, hey, can I go listen to Chris Voss for 4000 bucks for four days in Nashville? I said, absolutely. And then come back and tell us what you learned. Got a woman who works for us who's one of the most brilliant people we've ever had. She's, she's taught us all about emotional intelligence because she's been to two, two or three seminars. And now we're selling it. So I think you have to create a learning environment. Uh, I think you have to have courageous conversations. You have to have the guts to tell somebody they are not living up to their potential. One of the biggest mistakes that I think managers make is that they talk about people's uh, individual, you know, competency shortcomings. Don't do that. Just tell them, here's what bothers me. Your potential, I mean, your, your performance is here, your potential is here. I need you to tell me why is there this gap? And I've had that conversation with 500 people. You know how many people have ever argued with me about their potential? Zero. Zero. And and let Zero. me add to let me add to that because this is really important. Would I find that people that, like you say, aren't living to the potential, is two things: commitment, too many distractions going on in the day, yeah. they're not committed, and number two is, is they're not spending the time, like you said, to learn and educate themselves. Yes. Yeah. Right. And so if you're in a complicated business, say like our business, commercial real estate, yeah. and you're in a sales position and you have too many distractions going on during the day or you're not committed to the process and right. you're not willing to expand and learn because let's say it's new to you, you're doing yourself a disservice and you're doing the company a disservice. And so I think it's a great point. Let's let's switch gears a little bit. You know, my impression of sales incentives, okay, you see a lot of them out there are something that many companies struggle with. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I think it's one of the things that we thought about, you know, now was the fact that our people are very well compensated because we have to hire people who have lots of experience and who in the mind of the customer and in our mind could actually be a consultant in a reasonably short period of time because of their experience. But if your compensation, if they know what it is going in, if they know what their opportunity is, if they know what they have to do to do it, it's probably not a problem. But I think, you know, when I was a manager in the, in the pharmaceutical business, 
you know, I would have 10 salespeople and all 10 of mine would be in the top 50. And I got the same bonus as the guy who was last. Now, what I learned, my boss taught me a long time ago, my very first boss, because I got hired in November and the guy that got hired in December, he, he inherited the best territory in the country. I inherited the worst. And so he was making more money than I was salary wise. He was making more money and bonus. And I'll never forget. Jim said to me, I told him one time, it really bothered me that, you know, this other guy's doing better than I am financially. And I'll never forget what Jim said to me because it was, it was turning point in my career. He said, Jerry, look, he's always going to make more money than you until you get promoted. He said, but you need to understand this. Your rewards in this company are not going to come in this job. And if you can't live with that, then you need to go someplace else. And so, I mean, I thought long and hard about it, but, but now I wound up running the company and that guy's still in the territory, but my reverence for my boss, because he had the guts to tell me the truth because he had, he had been, he was phenomenal. I just, in fact, he's 84. He just wrote an ebook and he then, because I think I would think he's thinking I'm his most famous, you know, uh, previous employee. I actually wrote the forward to it because he's a, re it's a really good book. But my point is people want you just to be honest with them and just be honest. Don't try and BS them. Don't try and, and take them some down some rosy road. Uh, you just be honest with them and people will take that. But I think, you know, you have to create an environment wherever you work and where people want to work for you badly. What's, well, let, let's, talk, let's talk about that because that's a real important point you brought right. up. Why is it so hard to land on the perfect formula? And are there particular approaches that you typically recommend or suggest? Well, I think the big thing that we do, and I think we can do that a lot, a lot of companies can't do, uh, is we actually can listen to our employees that we can make changes based on what they said. I mean, you know, <laughs> this we hired this guy to do business development. Now, he, he hadn't sold a thing, right? And he complained about the fact that he can't get in a 401k for 18 months. So whenever my employees bring something like that to us, I'll always, you know, talk to somebody that actually can do something about it. And so I call our financial guy and I said, who's the idiot? That, that created this policy. So, well, that idiot would be you. And I said, well, can we change it? He said, yeah, you can change it. So we changed it to January the 1st. Then he's the guy who brought forth the dental benefit. So I had my, my admin check out the dental benefit. It's for one year, 1500 bucks. I said, we're going to have a dental benefit. It's not going to be, uh, you know, it's not going to be uh, anything, but just put it on your expense report, but you can do 1500 for two years. Then I had somebody come to me and said that we had, because we had changed from United Healthcare to uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield that they had to pay the first $500 for uh, physical therapy. Mm -hmm. So again, I make a call immediately and find out that, you know, I could add coverage for that for 10,000 bucks. So I did. And so we respond to their concerns. We listen to their concerns, but we also told them yesterday, we're not always going to be able to do all the things that you want us to do. But I'll tell you this, number one, we want every single one of you to stay here for a very long time. And we're doing everything we can to grow this company so that you have more opportunity and more stability. And we want this to be a really, really fun place to work. And I would say a lot of this is about leadership. And I would say our president, Matt Murphy, is probably as good at this as anybody I've ever met. And he's got, we got a senior, we got a VP of operations and she's a sidekick and they are terrific at keeping me in, 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 in the loop about what does it take to keep these people really excited about working at uh, Delta Point. I mean, you know, one of our last employees actually took a $30,000 pay cut to come to work. That's he fantastic. said, I'd rather work there than I would someplace else where I made more money because the culture is different. Let's talk about, um, so pricing and negotiating with backbone is an area where I've observed that there's sometimes a conflict interest between sales and the company, especially for B2B businesses. Right. Do you agree with that? And what organization structures do you typically recommend to remedy, remedy this? Oh, uh, I don't, you know, I can only speak for, uh, you know, for, for our company, I mean, the reality is, number one, we rarely respond to an RFP. 
if ever, because all they're asking for is how much can we beach up on price? Most of our clients ask us to sign a master service agreement uh, and they'll want to know, you know, how many hours is this going to take, et cetera. And all we do is we tell them exactly what's going to happen. Now, if they want to beat us up, and sometimes they do, then, you know, we we already have calculated. Now, what we usually do is we put, we put one or two things in the proposal that if they had to take them out, they wouldn't change the likelihood that they would be successful, but it might satisfy the people that are actually making the purchase, purchasing decision. Um, but I think you have to have some integrity. I mean, we're actually in, a, in, in, in discussion with, our, with ourselves about how, you know, sh we should actually raise some of our prices because we haven't done much in terms of price, you know, raising for a very long time. I'm not, it doesn't bother me to lose business. I mean, I'll tell you, one of the very first clients I had, I, I forget, it was first was about 120,000 bucks. And the guy said, look, we're, we're going to sign your proposal, but you're going to have to, you're going to have to take a haircut. So I said, well, let me ask you this question. I said, can I ask you some questions about that? He said, yeah. I said, how many people you want me to train? So he told me, I said, so that's the same number that's in the statement of work. Yeah. And I said, and do you want me to also then personally go out and train all of your districts? Yeah. I want you to do that. And you want me to give you people all these books? Yes. And I said, well, I don't need the weekend to actually give you a, a new price. You don't No, That's good. I said, it's the same thing as it was before you and I started this conversation. I said, let me make this really clear to you. Had I reduced this price, you know what you would have thought of me? You would have thought that I was stealing from you. And I ain't going to steal from you. I'm going to tell you what it costs. And if you want it, good. If you don't want it, I'll go someplace else. That's great. Great advice. Let me ask you. So two suggestions you had around realizing your goals are ones I particularly like. Okay. Number one is write it down. I am a yeah. big proponent of that. There is a, uh, the, there's been studies on it, how much, how important it is. I've been carrying a yellow legal pad of paper since I was a little kid on my hip and I recommend <laughs> everyone do it. And I'm telling you, it creates success. You could call me crazy, but it works. It's not and crazy, number two is don't let someone else or yourself talk you out of it. No. Did you learn this lesson the hard way when you were younger? No, I really didn't because I, you know, my grandfather was six foot seven. He was a professional basketball player. He loved sports and he was a major figure in my life because my parents were so dysfunctional. Uh, but they were always very, very, you know, excited about our, our, my brother and I's athletic success. What I do know is that my wife, for example, is one of the most talented people I've ever met. And we've been together for 28 years. Her mom tried to talk her out of her own success uh, because in her mother's paradigm, Mary Ann could not be, uh, you know, what she was aspiring to be. And the reality is she's a brilliant entrepreneur. She run, un, runs her own uh, business and she, people absolutely adore her. And so I, I just learned from a lot of other people that people will try and talk you out of success. But what their their point of view is that I couldn't do this. So I don't think you can either. Right. So I always tell people, look, there's greatness in you. and Everybody has greatness in them. I don't think the Lord put anybody on the Lord, Muhammad, or whatever you want to believe in. Uh, whoever is the, the great creator put us here for greatness. And and I think they put us they put us here for this. And I do believe that one of the things that the creator did for us was to make us creating creative creatures. We are here to create. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm here to create, I don't want to create mediocrity. I want to create excellence and I want to do everything I can to be as excellent as I can be. And I realize that too many people would say, you can't do that. You can't do that. And by the way, the first person is you. I mean, I'll never forget the first time I said to myself, I think I'm going to make, I'm going to make a million dollars next year. Now the most I'd ever made in my life is 461. And I'm having a conversation with a friend of mine and he asked me how much I made. I told him, he said, is that all? I said, Ian, well, <laughs> What are you talking about? And he said, man, the value that you are bringing to companies, you should be making a million dollars every year. And I remember leaving, you know, his office in Parsippany, New Jersey. And I remember saying this to myself, <clears throat> I'm going to make a million bucks next year. And then the next question I asked myself, Ben, was how am I going to do it? And you see, that's where people get stuck. They think that because they don't have the answer to it, that it can't be done. And then they may talk to somebody else who has the same mindset that they couldn't do it. And they'll say, you can't do it. And so people will give up. 
I decided I wasn't going to give up. I knew enough about psychocybernetics and the reticular activation system and visualization and writing down your goals and looking at your goals every single week. Uh, mine are in my pocket right now that I don't go anywhere without them. Uh, I knew enough of that if I did that and if I visualized that, that it would come true. And lo and behold, a month later, Mary Ann says to me, because at the time our business was she and I, she says, uh, you know, you need to hire somebody. And I said, well, I don't even know who to hire. She said, hire jo Joan Altimos. Well, who the hell is Joan Altimos? Well, she was one of friend, Marianne's friends who had just retired, but she was looking for some part-time work. And I hired Joan, one of the best hires I ever made in my life. And Joan enabled me to double my capacity. And that's what led me to such success. But all of that was not a coincidence. You know, Wayne Dyer used to say, we must manage the coincidences in our life, and there are none. And so that's, it was not a coincidence, but I do believe that there's an awful lot of people. My father came to see me in our home in Scottsdale, which was 5,100 square feet, you know, picked up by somebody driving a limousine and all this stuff. And, and he gets home and he calls my brother and he tells him, Hey, I want to talk to you about your, 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 your big brother. So you said, why dad, we just got there. I mean, he's doing really good. So he did. So my brother goes over and is, here's my father's question. Now my father quit school in the 10th grade, right? <clears throat> bankrupt three times. He asked my my brother, he said, uh, you think your you think your brother's doing something illegal? Jude said, what are you talking about? He said, he's got that, that big old mafia looking woman driving him around. He's got that, you know, that big expensive house there and he's really doing well. He said, you sure he's not doing something illegal? Yeah. See, his mindset was I couldn't succeed unless I had done something illegal. Well, let's, so, let's, let's frame that because there's two things you said I think are really important that we discuss. Write it down. Write yeah. down what you want to achieve. Like I yep. always ask, what do you want, right? Yeah. Well, answer that question, write it down. When you can write it down, you can achieve it and look at it frequently. The right. second thing that I thought was very well said that is important is surround yourself with like-minded people that are going to support you and not tear you down. And yeah. I am a big proponent of that. I've been living my life that when I have someone that – you know, uses what I call Jerry contractions. Can't, shouldn't, wouldn't. I, I can't stand them no. because I, I can't get my mind around. I don't believe in the word can't. Yeah. I think if you want to achieve something, you can. I want everyone to hear that out there, that you can achieve whatever you want. If you're persistent, surround yourself with the right people. Put yourself in the right rooms. And it's extremely important. You know, your book, The Relationship Edge, okay, has been a top seller for, for quite some time. And it's filled with very useful, practical uh, advice on sales. I'm curious, do you know exactly what you wanted to share before you're writing it? Well, yeah, I did because um, I had been to Pfizer and a guy at Pfizer, a group vice president, asked me, how do we get more time with customers? And so as I began to think about that, I realized that time is a function of the kind of relationship that you and I have. So if you and I have a great relationship, I mean, you want me to come out there? I'll come out there. Uh, you know, if you want to talk for an hour, I'll talk for an hour. I mean, go do whatever you want. So I bought six books that all were on how do you build business relationships, how do you build relationships. And I came to the conclusion that none of them told you <clears throat> how to do it. They all told you what to do. And so I said, I read them again, and I said, I'm just going to create a process by which people can understand how do you build a valuable relationship with somebody a that you don't know. I mean, one of my favorite relationships in the world is Herb Sendek and Herb mm -hmm. is actually a basketball coach at Santa Clara university. Uh, I think he's the fourth youngest coach in the history of college basketball to 400 victories. I didn't know Herb when I moved to, and I'm nobody, you know, uh, compared to Herb, but I wanted to meet him because I love college basketball. I want to be able to see a team so I, so I asked everybody I knew this question. Uh, how well do you know Herb Sendek, if at all? I asked 10 people. The 10th person said, I know him really well. Second question, uh, how comfortable would you be introducing me? I don't say, would you introduce me? How comfortable would you be introducing me? And he said, yeah, you want to have breakfast with him next week? And so I go see Herb. And now I know he's going to ask me, what, what do I want? So I also have to be prepared for that, right? Now, I was also mentoring a coach then at the time, a guy was coaching at VMI, who was leading the nation in scoring for like 10 years in a row. <clears throat> so I, we started by, by talking about uh, Duger Balkan. 
And so at the end, he said, so what do you want from me? And I said, well, honestly, coach, I don't really want anything. I got enough money. I can buy my own tickets. I said, I think your T-shirts are ugly, so I don't want one of them. Uh, I said, but let me ask you this question. I said, you have how many players in that locker room? Fifteen. I said, of those 15 players, how many of those players are going to be able to make their living without ever getting a job and they can make the basketball their entire life? He said, not a one of them. I said, well, let me tell you what I'd like to do. I'd like to spend an hour with them whenever you want me to, and I'm going to teach them two things. I'm going to teach them how to set and achieve stretch goals. I mean, how do they achieve extraordinary things, which is exactly, uh, Ben, what you and I were just talking about. How do you do that, right? You just, you just, you just laid it out. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to teach them how do you have, how do you build a network of people in college of people that, because in college, when you're a great athlete, you're a celebrity. The best time for you to, to leave your mom and dad sitting over there while you go meet some big booster is today because you can see mommy when you want to, but you can't meet a booster who can get you a job, you know, in any old day. I had that same, same conversation. I went to football practice Saturday, <clears throat> last Saturday. One football player came up to me and said, Mr. Rakoff, you know, I really do. Uh, I really do appreciate all you do. He's, he's a starting tight end. He said, but I want to get into orthopedic sales. And he said, would you help me do that? I said, I'd be glad to help you do that. And I said, I'll give you my virtual training for free. And I said, you can tell people I'm your mentor. And some people will think that's interesting. But my point is, I wrote the book because I wanted people to understand and one of the things, the last one of, I think one of the most things that I haven't said that I think is most important is don't make decisions for other people. I cannot tell you the number of people who tell me, you know, I was going to call you, but I know how busy you are. And so first place, you don't have a clue how busy I am. But if you want to talk to me, call me because I will either be a jerk, which case I think you would probably want to know that, or I will help you. One of the two. So I think I'd want to, you'd want to know that, but don't make a decision that because I have what you might think celebrity status, that that's a reason to not contact me. And so I say, you know, if you want to meet somebody, go meet them. Now, maybe you can't meet them, but you ought to understand what can you do for them that would make that interaction valuable. Now, the very next day, Herb asked me to go talk to his team. And then I told him, I said, by the way, before you leave, if you believe that recruiting is selling, I'll teach your coaches how to recruit. Can you do that next week? Now, if you go on my jerryacuff.com website, you can see a one minute and eight second video of Herb talking about me being the greatest thing since I, 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 I've seen it. No, it's a it's a great testimonial on your website. But I didn't know. When, well, when you were writing this book, okay, yeah, did you have any revelations or insights saying, "Oh my God, I'm not doing that." I got to start implementing this in my approach. Did yeah, that about, come about? Yeah, about 90% of it. Okay. <laughs> I mean, that's one of the good things about writing a book. I mean, the right. book, of, the book, right. of, the oh, by the way, it goes back to writing things down, does it? Oh, absolutely. You just, so it, we just it, learned something here, didn't we? Yeah, we did. And and I think, you know, I mean, doing, doing the, the book with Jeremy, Jeremy knows more about how to use your voice and tonality and flex than any, I actually posted this on LinkedIn this week. And I, and Jeremy is a wonderful person and I loved him from the, and he's got to be 30 years younger than me, but he's a wonderful guy, but he's wicked smart. And, uh, and he, and he loves to share what he does. And so when I try and learn from anybody, you know, my old boss used to say, when you're green, you're growing, when you're ripe, you're rotting. And so I don't want to rot, you know, I want to keep growing. And so I keep reading books and, Oh, uh, and watching podcasts and you don't have to, you don't have to read books anymore like I did because you can get book summaries and all that stuff. Podcasts, I think also are probably just as important. You know, I'm an introvert like you. Okay. And we're in roles where we shouldn't be introverts. Yeah. We can't to make money. Right. And, right. and feed our family and our employees, right. et cetera. How does an introvert? Okay. If you were, if you were coaching me, okay. How does an introvert overcome? Come, how overcome this to become a fantastic salesperson? What would you tell me? Well, I, what I would tell you is that uh, there's actually what I think is an introvert's advantage because introverts are by nature listeners 
and they don't really care about themselves as much as someone who's an extrovert. The extrovert wants to you know, put the focus on the things that, that, that are important to them, and they're not very good listeners, and they're not very good relationship builders by and large. Now, there are, there are exceptions to, to all of those things. But if you read, there's a very good book called The Introvert's Advantage. And, you know, I've talked a lot about uh, I like hiring introverts because introverts are people who are great at listening. They'll ask better questions. They'll make people feel heard. Uh, they won't be focused so much on them. They'll be focused on the other person. Uh, and I think they make phenomenal salespeople. Their problem is their own mindset that says, I can't. Their mindset is that introverts can't be successful. You and I, and, and you're probably like me, probably closer to an ambivert than an introvert. So that we, you, you have some extroverted qualities, but they're muted just like mine are. But the reality is our success is driven by the fact that we're really good at listening and thinking about things the way introverts naturally think about it. But that when, when, the, when the introvert has the mindset that you can't be successful in sales, if you're an introvert, then guess what? Your, your, your prophecy will become self-fulfilling. That's an interesting point you just brought up because you talked about introverts are great at the relationship process. Yeah. And let's talk. So the relationship process you teach is what you think, what you ask, what you do. Right. And I love the first thing because you really have to be aware. Okay. Your inner voice, what you say is, I'm going to, I'm going to be able to sell this. I believe in yeah. this product. I'm good at what I can do. I can communicate. Now I got to go and do it. So now what you ask and what you do, explain what you ask and what you do. Well, I think the, what you ask is sort of, you know, the kind of things that we do in sales, which is you, you have to, you have to find out whether, you know, what you are wanting this other person to do is in their best interest. And it, regardless of what's in your best interest, God goes back to having the right definition of selling. And so the other thing that the ask is about is how do you develop common ground? Because common ground is, is, is sort of the foundation of many, many relationships. <clears throat> and so whenever, like I did a call yesterday with a client, so I didn't even know who we were talking to. I knew the company's name, but I know people. So I went to, then I looked at who was invited. So hour and a half before the call, I looked at everybody. I looked everybody up on LinkedIn. I looked where they used to work. I wrote their names down. Next thing I did was I looked at all of the, the connections that we had in common. And there were six people on that call. I had connections with every single one of them. And so what I ordinarily do is I'll, I'll ask somebody, hey, do you know, you know, ex I say, I see that you and so-and-so are connected. Is that a strong connection for you? And if it is, then immediately I've got common ground. Now, a lot of times people think common ground is something that's like, you know, we both like the, the, you know, the Pittsburgh Steelers. I mean, I like the Steelers because you know, I'm a big Mike Tomlin fan. I mean, Tomlin, big, you know, his first job after college when he graduated from William Mary was coaching football VMI where I went. And, um, and he's, and I think he's a great coach. So if it's, you know, so as a Pittsburgh, you know, uh, Steelers fan, you got that, but it's, it's basically, how do I learn what you treasure? See, I, if I find out what you treasure, and it's usually in your case, it's probably your family. Obviously, it's your family. Uh, obviously, it's your business. Obviously, it's those things that you're doing, to, like with this potential university thing where you can make a huge difference in people's lives. Then you and I can, we can start having a completely different conversation. That doesn't mean that we can at some point in time take a left-hand turn and begin to talk about business if I began to think that there may be some you know, opportunity there. So I'm not at all shy with my clients. And, and I, mean, I, I met the CEO of this client that we're working with now that's had a huge success. But I said, look, everything that we've done for you is going to be a waste if you don't solve this problem. And I'm just telling you that because it's true. Now you can do whatever you want to with it, but I'm telling you, if you don't do this, this is going to be a waste of money. And, uh, and I had a conversation yesterday with the VP of sales, told him the same thing. And then he said, well, you know, we don't really have anybody that's capable to go call on those people. I said, well, then let me go call on them because I guarantee you I'm capable. I guarantee you I can do it. So I don't I think you you also get a degree of confidence when you know you can help people and you, and you know you're not you're not kidding yourself and you're not kidding them and you're not doing it for your own selfishness. You're doing it because, you know, you want them to be successful and you can play a role in it. 
my question to you is before we got cut off is to really understand what you do and learn from you and be able to receive your benefits and in, in, in your teachings what's the best way to follow you jerry acuff well i try and post once a week on linkedin and okay. i usually i usually do something fairly significant i mean in terms of you know conceptually um you know i think um the books are probably pretty good. We also have virtual training program and the relationship thing. I mean, if somebody wants that, you know, we sell that to them for near next to nothing. It's what's, the, what's the company website? So people, can log uh, it's uh, Delta point.com. Okay. www.deltapoint.com. So, so we're going to wrap up, but before we wrap up, Jerry, we ask our guests three questions. All right. And we'll rapid fire it so we can get you out of here and get on sure. with your day. So, you are uh, in the Ionet studios, you're laying on our couch, and I ask you to close your eyes, and and the today Jerry A. A, a. Cuff is going to speak to his 16-year-old self. What advice would you tell yourself now that who you are and what you know, you could educate your 16-year-old self? What would you tell yourself? You will be whatever you resolve to be. Most people never resolve to be anything, and I'm going to resolve to be great. Okay, okay. So it's your last. It's it's your last day on earth. It's your last meal on earth. You and I are, are sitting down to have a meal. What are we eating? Probably an In-N-Out burger. Oh, oh, double animal style. <laughs> I don't know. How do you I, like it? How do you do it? Lettuce no, wrap? Just, are you an animal style? How how do you take yours down? I just eat an and I just eat it like I do. First place I love and I love. Uh, you don't have them, you know, where we are, but uh -huh. it's one of my favorite places to eat. Oh, that's great! All right, and what are you washing that down with? Probably uh, unsweetened iced tea with some nice uh, sweet and low. Okay, so you're not going for the sweetened tea like you can get in Memphis. No, I don't. I don't drink that. Okay, and. In our studio, as you can see behind me, I have electric guitars, we have a drum set, and we have a grand piano to my left. If you were in studio with me, Jerry, and you can have any musician or band, it, they could be living or deceased, who is in studio with us playing us a song? Your choice. Junior Walker and the All-Stars. All right. And I would have him sing, What Does It Take to Win Your Love for Me? Fantastic. And I love the saxophone. Or it would be George Strait. He stopped, uh, I mean, uh, Amarillo by morning. Nice. Well, Jerry, I wanted to thank you for coming on. Your wealth of knowledge. Uh, we'll definitely have you back on because we didn't get to talk about everything. And, and, and it was so great to see you. If you are interested in following the, the Ben Reinberg I Own It podcast, drop kick that right hand button and click subscribe. If you want to follow me, go to BenReinberg.com for more information on how we can help you with health, wealth, relationships, and business. If you want to learn commercial real estate, go to AllianceCGC.com. Feel free to go on and peruse and look about who we are. And if you're interested in investing in the brand new Alliance Medical Property Fund, just direct message me, reach out to me, and we'll be happy to show you how we can benefit your life just like it does mine. Thanks again, Jerry. We appreciate it. You own it and keep owning it. And thank you for coming on today. Thank you for listening to the I Own It podcast with Ben Reinberg. To hear our past episodes and connect with Ben, visit benreinberg.com.